Hello and welcome to Stories from India, a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I'm your host Narad Muni and I'm a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I'm a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. In this episode, we are going to continue the story of the churning of the ocean or Samudra Manthan. If you haven't heard the previous two episodes, I highly recommend you check those out. But here's a short recap anyway. The Devs were led by their king Indra into temporary bankruptcy because he offended the wrong person, Durvasa. In a Thanos-like snap your fingers moment, he cursed their home in heaven, their magic wishing tree, and everything else they enjoyed right out of existence. The Devs and Indra appealed to my dad, Brahma, the creator of the universe, who simply redirected them to Vishnu, the preserver. Vishnu had just the solution for them. And that was to churn the ocean of milk to synthesize things they had lost. But to do so, he told them they needed to collaborate with their enemies, the Asurs. Indra managed to get Bali, the king of the Asurs, buy-in by tempting him with the nectar of immortality. And so, on the appointed day, the Devs and the Asurs assembled in a tug-of-war position. But not actually for a tug-of-war. Instead, this was going to be cooperative pulling. Vasuki Nag, the snake around Shiva's neck, served as the rope, and it went around Mount Mandar, which was the churning rod. The mountain began to sink pretty much right away. And so, Vishnu transformed into a giant turtle and held up the mountain on his back. Meanwhile, the Devs and the Asurs continued to pull. No one knew what to expect, other than Vishnu, of course. But he was busy holding up Mount Mandar at that time. I knew, of course. I knew everything that was going to take place here. But this was something that I could not and need not interfere with. I knew Vishnu had the situation completely under control. Brahma was in charge of cataloging and stock keeping anything new that might emerge from the churning. He had been idle for a while now, but he was suddenly about to get very busy. I mean, he even had to create an extra pair of arms just to jot everything down. The very first Ratna to emerge was not a jewel at all, which is the literal meaning of the word Ratna. It was a goddess, the goddess Lakshmi. She is the goddess of fortune and wealth. Brahma was shocked. He was about to take opening bids on the first Ratna that emerged. But seeing as it was a living, breathing person, or rather living, breathing god, he didn't quite know how to proceed here. Luckily, Lakshmi had an answer. She chose to be with that god over there, the one standing right next to Narad. I almost jumped out of my skin at that, because I had been standing all by myself. I turned around quickly and I saw Vishnu. What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be under the sea holding up Mandar? I asked him, shocked. Come on, Narad. Why do you ask such a question? 
Haven't you learned anything about the power of Maya? He replied. He paused a bit and added, Do you need another demonstration? Like in episode 0 of your podcast? I replied, Thank you for calling out episode 0 for new listeners. I will add that the word Maya means illusion. But to get back to your question, I definitely do not need another demonstration. I know all the things you can do with Maya. I paused and added, For instance, I know exactly what you're going to do here with the Amrit once it's out. Lakshmi had meanwhile strolled over. Her wish had been fully respected. She was free to be with whomever she wanted to be with. Shiva, Parvati and Bali came over and there were lots of handshakes all around. Obviously, this was pre-COVID. We didn't have to wait much for the next few Ratnas though. The Apsaras or Divine Celestial Dancers came next. They were known for their beauty. They included Rambha, Menaka and a few others. All of them chose to be with the Gandharvas or the musicians of heaven. And then came Varuni. She was not the most presentable of those that had appeared so far. She went to the Asurs. Devs and Asurs continued to pull away as more Ratna emerged. There was a bow and a shell. Those went to Vishnu. A jewel called Kaustub. Again, this went to Vishnu. There were a pair of earrings that Indra claimed so that he could give them as a gift to his mom, Aditi. Airavat, Indra's elephant, returned. And Indra was so happy to see him, they hugged. Don't try this at home, folks. Being hugged by an elephant can crush you. Next, a wish-fulfilling cow emerged. And she went to Brahma. I was about to remark that family dinners were going to get very interesting in the future when I saw... Brahma passing on the cow to a group of rishis. Oh well. Maybe grim silence at the dinner table over not having a wish-fulfilling cow in the family would have to do as a substitute. Next emerged a couple of trees. A parijata tree and a kalpariksha or wish-fulfilling tree. Both were taken up by Indra. He placed the Kalpariksha in heaven, and we call this the Milky Way in our night sky. The Parijat blossoms year round, and it became the pride of Indra's garden. Bali was starting to get a bit antsy now. His team had received nothing important so far. True. He hadn't negotiated this part with Indra, but this was quite unfair. Vishnu and Brahma began to sense that, and so when the next Ratna emerged, they presented it to Bali. It was a horse. And what a horse! It had seven heads, but nevertheless looked majestic. Oh, great, said Bali. Seven more mouths to feed for the price of one saddle space, he grumbled. But secretly, he was pleased. When the next Ratna emerged, Devs and Asurs gasped. It was the moon. And the moon had not existed before. 
Is that made of cheese? asked the dev. And why does it have all those holes? asked the Nasur. I call dibs on that hair ornament, said a voice. It was Shiva. Shiva, if you haven't heard episode 42, River Mother, likes to take care of his hair. And the moon fit his hair perfectly. Bali, jealous of all the other gods for the Ratnas they had, called out, Dips on the next Ratna. But that was a bad idea. Because the next Ratna was poison. This wasn't the ordinary poison that divine creatures could resist. This was a poison of divine origins. It could consume anything, including the fabric of the universe itself. It was called Halahal, but the characteristics may remind you of a black hole. There were panic stares all around as Devs and Asurs screamed. I knew what could save them, and indeed the universe. I'd been prepared. So I quickly turned to face Shiva and said, Do it now, please. I knew what Shiva had been thinking. He was later going to tell me so himself. Eternal knowledge and foresight do come in handy. The downside is that there are no surprise birthday parties for me, ever. Anyway, Shiva, energized by my words, stepped forward and sucked in the poison out of the air and out of the ocean. He drew it all in, immediately. That's how awesome he is. Before he could swallow it though, Parvati grabbed his neck. Don't worry folks, she was not strangling him or anything. She was just limiting the spread of the poison. Her quick thinking action limited the poison just to his throat. And that is why Shiva has a blue throat. He's also called Neelkant for that reason. Along with Halahal, there had emerged a Lakshmi or Jesta, the goddess of misfortune kind of like an antimatter version of Lakshmi. But because there wasn't an antimatter version of Vishnu, Jeshta instead married a Rishi. Since then, she has taken on the task of occupying inauspicious places. Her story is an interesting one as well, and we can cover that in a future episode. Once Halahal had been removed from the air and the ocean, the Devs and Asurs got back to their churning. And finally, there emerged a god, Dhanavantri, carrying a pot of something that looked like Amrit or the nectar of immortality. And that's exactly what it was. All Devs and Asurs dropped Vasuki Nag and rushed to Dhanavantri. There was immediate disagreement on how the Amrit should be divided. One conflict averse Dev asked hopefully if people had bowls and spoons. Another asked Dhanavantri if he had the recipe so they could just make more. But Dhanavantri, the god of medicine, simply smiled in return. This is starting to get out of hand. We have to fix this, Indra said to Bali. But neither was clear how. The Devs and the Asurs had worked so hard for this moment. Imagine if a tournament finals has ended in a tie, as it can in some sports. If two bitter rivals had worked hard and both been awarded a single trophy, 
Could they really be expected to handle that, well, sportingly? You boys look like you're in a muddle. May I help? Asked a voice. Everyone stopped talking at once and looked at her. She had some charm, some charisma about her. I knew that every time she spoke, the world would stop still just to hear her. Lady, I can use your help all day, any day, said Vanasur. What's a lady like you doing in a place like this anyway? Asked another. Hey, can I follow you on Instagram? And the questions flowed. One Asur, Rahu, was not convinced. He turned to face Vishnu and asked, Is this you? Vishnu just shrugged. But he gave me a secret wink and showed me an empty bottle labeled Mohini. Mohini told all the Asurs, I'll give you all the details of my Instagram feed and anything else you might need. But first things first, boys. I don't have an easy way to say this, but you guys don't exactly smell great. It's definitely from all the hard work you've been doing all day. Why don't you all go have some quick showers? And when you're back, I'll divide the Amrit between yourselves. And just like you, Asur said, the devs can wait behind in line for you. For the shower, that is. She muttered under her breath. But no one would have heard her anyway. Eager to please this beautiful lady, they had all rushed off. Mohini spoke to Indra. Hey, quick, let's divide this up. Huh? What? asked Indra. He was still tongue-tied and staring at Mohini. He still hadn't realized that Mohini was just an avatar of Vishnu. But when he did catch on, all the devs sprung into action. And quickly, the entire pot of Amrit had been divided up and consumed. But as it turned out, not all of the consumers had been devs. Rahu, who had been skeptical of Mohini, had hung back and disguised himself as a dev. He too was now consuming the Amrit. Quickly, Mohini took out her Sudarshan Chakra. It's a flying disc, kind of like a circular saw. She used it to chop off Rahu's head to prevent him from turning immortal. But it was too late. Rahu was decapitated, but both his head and body were independently immortal. We know these as Rahu and Ketu. They are in our solar system. The Asurs, when they returned, were disappointed. And rightly so. For all their hard work and equal participation, they had very little to show for it. They would go back into battle against the Devs. But those stories we'll cover in other episodes. That's all I have for the main story. But I have lots of notes this time. So buckle in. First and foremost, let's talk about this cosmic scale experiment. I've called this project the Large Hill Churner, or LHC. You may have heard about the largest machine ever built by people, the Large Hadron Collider, at CERN in Geneva. The initials are the same, and this is not a coincidence. There are striking parallels between the two. Both the Samudra Manthan 
and particle accelerators in general are experiments on a grand scale. The ones who designed these weren't very sure of what exactly to expect. Every particle that emerged was a gift towards expanding human scientific knowledge. On a similar note, it is common in these particle experiments for a matter-antimatter pair to emerge together. Kind of like what happened with Lakshmi and Alakshmi. There was a big media outcry about a decade ago when the LSC went operational. The outrage was about the possibility of the LHC creating micro black holes. Those might be enough to devour the Earth. That's definitely not a concern for the LHC though. Its energies are far too low to allow that to happen. Devs and Asurs pulling on Vasukinag raise particles to way higher energies than the LHC could ever hope to. Besides, having just glimpsed the future, I can confidently state that the Earth is not due for a black hole scare for a while. The parallel between the Halahal and black holes is clear enough as an ever-expanding place in space that pulls in and consumes its surroundings. It can only be contained by enclosing it in a divine extra-dimensional body like Shiva's. I won't say more on that. Dealing with black holes is a part that human scientists will have to figure out for themselves. The Devs and the Asurs stopped after they got the Amrit from the Ocean of Milk. It's possible that if they had kept going, they would have discovered a few more surprises. At this point, we have covered all 10 avatars of Vishnu. That is, including Mohini and Kurma as two separate avatars. There are more stories of Mohini that we'll cover in a future episode. We also have to cover more stories of Parshuram. And of course, we'll continue talking about Ram and Krishna as we go through the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. I'll be doing Parshuram stories soon, and at that time, we'll cover some interesting thoughts around the evolution of the avatars. We've encountered Apsaras before. In particular, we have met Menaka as Shakuntala's mom in episode 37 of Fishy Engagement. And the Apsara Anjana as Hanuman's mom in episode 25, Up, Up and Away. Lakshmi is an awesome goddess in her own right. And she has done some absolutely fabulous things. Dhanavantri, the god who appeared with the Amrit, is actually not the god of modern medicine. Rather, he is the god of Ayurved, an ancient version of medicine that is still practiced to this day. Aditi's earrings that we talked about earlier are the same ones that were stolen by Narakasur. Mini episode 41.5 that's all for now. In the next episode, we'll be talking about Razia Sultana. She was a fearless woman, a wise ruler, and the first woman to rule India. If you have comments or suggestions, or if there are any particular stories you'd like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. Thanks to all of you listeners for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. I'll see you next time.